Welcome, everyone. Um, I just have to disappoint you if you have that buzzword bingo card. The topic is so new, the words are not buzzwords yet. So maybe next year you will have luck with that. So I'm talking about replacing reality. And at first, I want to start with a mandatory about me stuff, just really quick, OK? I, I keep it short. Uh, I'm active in IT security since around 13 years. And I'm working for entity security as a hacker and social engineer. And as you can imagine, before you give a presentation, you, you practice it with buddies and friends, coworkers, and so on. And one of them, he was so blasted by my talk and my presentation, he said, hey, you know what? I will give you a short video to just present at the start of your talk. So I just want to show it to you. Will it play? No? Oh, no sound? No sound? There should be some sound. Wait a moment. Why is there no sound? In the beginning, I had no picture. Now I don't have any sound. Maybe it's working now. Let me see that again. Hold on. There's no... Let me unplug that. Well, always something. Let me see. There should be some sound. No, no sound. That's a pity. Why is PowerPoint refusing to play any sound now? You should have some audio too. It's part of what I want to show. Um, anyone got an idea? No. See, anyone? In, in your file or in your program? No. Okay, I'll just keep on. He would have he would have heard Trump talking with his voice. So um, to keep on, obviously I'm a buddy of Donald Trump. Uh, I try to get that working in a moment to show you that again. So the agenda for that is I want to tell you what a deepfake is, what that word means, a little history of what deepfakes are or how they came into life, how they work, how deepfakes are made, just to show you how easy it is, basically. Then I want to give you a live demo, um, have a little look into the future, what might come up to us, um, also the impact on companies and individuals, and the solution on how to deal with that. So just really quickly, what is a deepfake? If you look at Wikipedia, deepfake is just a combination of the words deep learning and fake. So you create with an artificial intelligence, that's where you can just cross off that word onto your, on your bus bingo card, um, re changing, replacing information in media files, like swapping faces into videos. Um, to have a look at how that all came into life, how it developed, well, in the first place, it was created out of curiosity. How many things were created? People were just curious, how do deep learning work and how can we do that, just as a little programming exercise maybe on how to create stuff. And multiple cr projects were created and they're also published on GitHub, a lot of them as open source. You get some closed source projects for that. And well, it's freely available. In the past, when you looked at swapping faces, especially faces in videos, you had to go to Hollywood, into the big movie studios, and they had to have the specialists, they had to have the equipment, they had to have all different kinds of stuff. And now they don't need that anymore because here, it costs a lot of money. But in the year 2017, it started with the neural networks, with deep learning um, on how to do that on basically any machine. As a little trivia, maybe you knew that already, but did you know that Nicolas Cage is the actor with the most appearances in Hollywood movies? If you didn't know that, now you know it. I guess you at least know the movie Face Off, 
of him, where his face is swapped with the one of John Travolta, and like that's the story behind that, but um, that might be the reason why he was used. And um, maybe some of you have seen the newer Superman movie. Did anyone see that movie, the newer Superman movie? No one? Okay. But Nicolas Cage played, had a role in there, and um, I just want to show you which role he played. He didn't play Superman. But if you wait a moment, actually he played Lois Lane, or it seems like. So that was just like, that's a deep fake where his face was put into another movie. And there are several out there just, you know, to show the face off effect on him. But another person, for instance, um, they thought about like with the newer Star Wars movies, they had to put Princess Leia in there. And some of you might know the actress who played Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, died before the movie. So they had to spend a lot of money to put her face into that movie again. And another person thought, why not just use a deepfake application, a face swapping application to just show what it's capable of. So here you see a side by side or top by bottom comparison. The upper movie is the original one, the lower one in the bottom is a deep fake. So if you look at that, um, you might notice a little bit of difference, but it's not that you can recognize one was made in Hollywood and the other was not in the end. So um, that is where the curiosity part came into play and where people were just initially doing that. But then maybe you have heard about deep fakes because it had some, well, bad press, bad media coverage. Um, I'm not sure if you can read everything. You don't have to read all the references in Wikipedia here. I just put it there. But most of them are about fake porn, where faces of Hollywood actresses or singers were put into adult movies or revenge porn. So that was at the beginning of the year where that topic got some media coverage at least, but it pretty quickly disappeared again from, from media and from, from news sites and so on. So that is just the little history that you know where it comes from. So on to the topic, how do they work? Um, I will go into the theory of how video deep fakes work. In the first place, I try to not go into too much detail. Um, but I want to show you basically how machine learning works. For instance, some of you might have seen something like that, which is a representation of a regular machine which is learning something. Um, to keep it not too abstract, just imagine you want to have an artificial intelligence which is learning to predict tomorrow's temperature. Okay? So on the one hand, you have the input layer with several nodes where you just put several information into, like today's temperature, today's humidity, today's probability of rain. Then you have some hidden layers with nodes. Everything is a node, like each circle. And it does some yeah, calculations, basically, and you get a single output where it says tomorrow it will be like 20 degrees Celsius. I guess so. In order for an artificial intelligence to learn how or which result it should be put out, you have to train it and you take a lot of data and you feed it to that machine. And uh, for instance, you take the weather data of the last 100 years, where you know what the input variables are, basically what is put into the into input nodes, and you know also the next day's weather. So what the artificial intelligence is doing, it's learning in the hidden layers how to put the weight on the edges to achieve these results. And once you've trained that for a long time, or quite some time, you will be able to predict, or it might be able to predict the weather of the next day. That will not help for swapping faces in videos, but that's just the general thing. What you're using for swapping faces in videos are so-called autoencoders. So they are a little different, and basically their functionality is pretty useless in the beginning if you look at it, because what they should do is they should map or take the input nodes, each and one of them, and basically just 
put them out again as the same. So if you have, say, a one in the, the first input node, the output node should just be one again. So how does it help? Um, if you think about images, they're just a lot of pixels. Yeah, say you have a 256 by 256 picture and that just consists of pixels. If you want to reproduce that image, you have to have not a single output node, but you have to have the same amount of pixels being put out. Um, if you look at that right now with the same amount of nodes in the hidden layers as the input and output layers, we might face an issue, which is looking like that. The machine might learn to just put every node directly out again and not do any calculations in between. In order to prevent that, that autoencoding is used. So re you reduce the number of nodes in between. Basically, to just say it simply, um, you have one part, the red one is a so-called encoder where you compress the information to a certain degree, and then you have a decoder which learns to take that compressed information and recreate the original image or whatever you have. Um, to show it a little better for images, just go ahead and here you can see you have an original image, you have the encoder which is co uh, creating a so-called Latin face. There's the, the compressed version of that image and then you have a decoder which is reconstructing the face, the original image. How do we face swap now? Pretty easy. We just create two of them, like um, you train one of these autoencoders for face A and one of the encoders or machines for face B. And initially, they just learn to reconstruct the same picture or the same face. But the trick is easy. You just swap the decoders. So you can just say, OK, we are encoding each face. And then we're just swapping the encoders. So if you cannot see it in the back, basically original face A is a smiling girl and um, original face B is a well, that looking guy. You just encode it to have a Latin face A, which is smiling, but you use decoder B to create a smiling guy, which was that in the beginning, and vice versa. So that's the only magic or your trick how that is working on a higher and a little abstract level. Going over the theory of audio deepfakes, um, it's just, well, there are several papers on how to synthesize voice for text-to-speech systems. They are also published by Google, for instance. They are very popular. Um, it's called Tacotron version 1 and 2. They're also using it. If you're using Google Home, for instance, or Google Maps for finding your way around, the voice there is using that text-to-speech system. Um, Baidu published Deep Voice, which is also pretty well-known, but um, if we look at the papers, that's even more complex than that image face swapping. So um, just to put it in a nutshell, basically that machine has to learn to align spoken text in WAV files to a certain text. So if we look at the requirements, what is needed to train such a machine, you need at least five to six hours of the material of a speaker. Plus, you need a transcript of the auto, uh, audio material. So you need a text file where you have um, everything written down again as sentences, basically, so that it can learn which spoken text is aligning to which written text, so that it can reverse in the end. Um, good. Let's have a look of how deepfakes are made and what's needed for that. The components for a video deepfake are pretty easy to show you. At first, I had a webcam, which was just a regular webcam you can buy at Amazon, for instance, or in any hardware store. Um, no special requirements for that. There was a, deep, uh, um, a green screen involved and an NVIDIA graphics card. NVIDIA is pretty mandatory because um, you need to use CUDA, which allows you to access your graphics card for programming and not just for gaming. If you have a short look at the costs, well, a webcam runs around 80 euros, the green screen 90 euros, 
Graphics card is a little more expensive since that's also used for Bitcoin mining. High demand means higher prices. That's why it's more expensive than usual. Um, tie, wick, and pin ran around 30 euro, and being the president of the USA is priceless, of course. Um, and just to give you an imagination on how that looks, I have a side-by-side -side video. Uh, the right part is me, the left part is a swapped fit. No, sorry, it was the other way around. So um, you can see it's pretty much just, it learned how to replace my face with Trump's face. And the rest is just some basic video editing with a green screen and so on. So you can just use available software. For instance, you can rent Adobe Creative Cloud for 20 euros or so a month and just use it to edit the video. In order to create an audio deepfake, which I will try to get running in a moment, um, it's a little different. I just want to remind you again of what is needed. So we need a model. We need to train basically the machine to be able to um, yeah, learn and um, output the text, but we need a model for that, which requires five hours of auto material and a transcript. So I thought listening to Trump for around five hours at least, I mean, I, like my, I really like my company and to work for them, but there are certain lines you do not cross. I mean, that's just, no. Fortunately, GitHub came to the rescue. Um, there is someone who published that, um, yeah, little, it's not even a paper, it's just a little text. And Q Pyong, he also um, created some, some programs, like he did some implementations of various, like of Tacotron, of Deep Voice, and DCTTS, which I used. For, for my um, text to speech um, synthesization. And he was asked very often, like, how much material, how much audio source material do we need of a speaker to train a proper model? And he got really fed up by that. And then he came up with an idea and he said, why don't you just take a pre trained model which can output proper voice, which is trained, for instance, for the English language? And then you just take one minute of a speaker's material of another speaker, and you just train your existing model with that, and you will have a model which is able to, yeah, basically give out the audio and um, everything of the speaker you want to train with. So I thought, okay, listening to Trump for a minute and writing a transcript for that, I can do that. That's not so bad, okay? So um, that's what I did in the end. And I just took one minute of his State of the Union speech, trained my machine for that, and in like 10 to 15 minutes, I got a result which is okay, and I try and hope to, to have in a moment. Um, so just to show you live how easy it is to create that, basically, uh, let me just restart this machine here real quick. Um, I will just go ahead and skip that audio part for, for now because I try to restart my presentation laptop in a moment. Um, and maybe, I'm not sure, I, I think most of the, you were in the keynote and you missed Trump this morning at Area 41 here. Yeah, I guess so. So I just want to show you that real quick because I just took a video of that. So let's move that over. Which side is it? Here, okay. So if you didn't see him, that's a video of him at the NTT security booth where he was real briefly and said hi. So um, no, I just want to show you basically it's, it's quite easy, um, the creation of a deepfake. 
So I use something called Open Face Swap, which open means you can just download it if you want to. Um, you have different settings, and um, I was talking when I was talking about the machines how they work. I was always talking about images and not videos. I think you might. Remind that. So in the end, a video is nothing more than a set of images just put together into a video. So in the first place, you're going ahead and just split a video into single pictures. So that was the video I took in the beginning. That is me with a wig looking something like Donald Trump, but my face, obviously. And then you have to align the faces. So basically, what the software does is it takes the pictures, detects where the face is, and crops them out in a certain um, size. Because as you might have remembered with the autoencoders, I want to have the same number of input nodes and the same number of output nodes. And in order to swap the images in, in the end, you need to have them to be of the same size. So. Uh, what it does is it just creates you a collection of just the faces and not the entire image. So that was my training set for, for the first part. And then we do have a training set for Trump where I just took a video of him from YouTube and um, also just split that up into several thousand images. And we also do have the alignment here where you just see his face. Um, I can go through that. You see it's just a lot of different ex expressions of him. So, And then you go ahead and let the machine train and create that model for that, for swapping the faces. I just let that run for a little moment. In the beginning it takes a little moment. Next time I start it, it will be a little faster. But just to give you an impression of how it looks like, it's like very easy in the end. So for the ones of you who are interested in what's under the hood, it's just using TensorFlow. I mean, some of you might have heard that. And that is what it is looking like in the beginning. Um, so here you can see in the first column is the original face which was extracted from, from the images. So on the left half it's the training set A and on the right half it's training set B. And you, you can just guess what the next two columns are. So um, you cannot see it right now but I will show you a different set where you can really see it. And what it is, is that column here is just showing where the artificial intelligence tries to re recreate the original image, yeah? Where it just tries that, but it's not working that well. And the next one, or not yet, and the next one is showing like the original image decoded with the second decoder for the second person. Um, I just stop that here real quick and we'll... Um, open the model I trained for for some time. So, and if I start that, you will be able to see what it looks in the end. And I just trained that for around three hours, three and a half hours, just as a proof of concept. Um, so for you to get an impression how long or how short it takes to create such a thing. So here you can see it's, it's way better and you can notice or you see what the recreated images look like with the, uh, with the different decoders. And you see it tries to match the facial expression as good as it can at least. Um, good. So that's basically how video deep, deepfakes look like. It's all depending on the source material you have and on which quality you get. So you have to, of course, have a look that both facial expressions are looking the same, that they're like similar at least. But what that 
tool, for instance, also does for you is um, it automatically adjusts the color of the skin. So if you have like Trump and myself, like my first videos I took were just with me without any makeup on. And that, well, I was a quite pale Trump. But yeah, that is possible to get a seamless integration of that target face into the original video if you want to. Um, okay, so let's have a look at what's next and what the next steps might be in the future. Um, unfortunately, the sound doesn't work. I will just go through the presentation and I will restart the laptop and try to get the audio part to show you about the audio part again. So please bear with me. Um, what you will hear is that the audio, well, the one I pre uh, created as a proof of concept, you still hear some echo, you hear some artifacts in there, but what I have here are um, audio samples from, from Google's Tachotron team, and I tell you, you will not be able to say these are artificially generated, but they sound like a real person. And it's the same sentences, just sounding totally different. So what can we expect? Well, the technology will be used by the good and the bad guys, likewise. Um, by the good guys, sure, for entertainment purposes maybe, or so, or just for research. For the bad guys, well, let's have a look at the impact on us and what that could mean for us. Um, I don't think there will be totally new attacks, but existing attack methods and scenarios will be enhanced, harder to detect, and easier to fall for for the people. If you think of impersonation, especially of C-level fraud, CFO fraud, where um, some people, employees, received an email saying, hey, please send us $10 million because we want to acquire something in China or so. Um, go ahead. Well, employees start to get aware of that, but what if you get a call of your CFO or someone who pretends to be the CFO and has the voice of the CFO? Well, who should detect that if it's good or perfectly executed? You won't stand a chance against that. And um, the same goes for blackmailing. For instance, another scenario where you say, can say, okay, I want to blackmail a certain individual, like a C-level, where I assume he has a lot of money, or if I want just a regular employee to plug in my USB stick or to visit a certain site or to execute something or to whatnot. So just think about if you receive an email where it states, hey, I've seen you, being somewhere else on a business trip, visiting a different woman, for instance, you don't want your wife to see that, right? And you get a video where you can see someone who's having your face go into someone else. Um, that's just one instance. And just prove that it's not you who was in the video, because if you were sent that video just after you went on a business trip, well, it's hard to prove that it's not you. Or you could blackmail entire companies. For instance, think about sending a company or a company receives an email saying, if you do not want this news here, that video of your CEO declaring that you're bankrupt or that you lost all your customer data, um, if you do not want that to be sent out to news agencies, and all of you know how fast news agencies spread news without even relying or checking if that's true or not, um, your stock could have a very, yeah, might drop very fast. If you remember um, Elon Musk from Tesla, his April Fool's joke, uh, where he declared bankruptcy of Tesla, well, the, the stock fell even further than on that day. So these are just a couple of examples on how that technology can be used um, in context of security or how to attack companies. So what is the solution to that? Well, at first I asked my buddy Trump and he said, I have no clue at all. So I went ahead and asked another buddy of mine and I thought, well, he's a professor, maybe he might know. And well, he said, good news everyone, we are all doomed. Um, then I thought, okay, let's think for yourself about how that might work or what solutions could be. And in my opinion, at the moment, the best 
protection against those kinds of attacks is just to know that they're possible at all and to have your employees, for instance, in a company, um, to tell them that it's possible. Because if a person doesn't even know that it's possible, and just imagine a person gets a call and um, you cannot create the audio just in real time. You have a small delay, but you can generate these voice samples very fast. And if you say, okay, uh, I'm the CEO, I'm just on a business trip, my reception is not so good, I have a little delay in, in my voice, basically, and the person doesn't know that it might be an attack, well, chances are they will do whatever the person asks for. For example, transferring some money, because it sounded like the CEO and you cannot blame the person, basically. Um, but knowing about that, is the first step. Second one, of course, is use your brain. But sometimes it's hard because if it sounds like a legitimate request, well, how should you differentiate between that? Because these deepfakes will get so good, human senses will not be able to do that. Then you might say, hey, Dave, yeah, there will be a program out there. Yeah, of course. Um, the Munich AI Lab, for instance, they're also uh, already researching and developing another artificial intelligence which should be able to detect deep fakes and report that to, to users and say, hey, this is not the real deal. But we will have another situation as with malware and anti-malware, that rat race. Um, the creators of deep fakes will know how that detection algorithms and that artificial intelligence works. They will improve their artificial intelligence to create deep fakes and we have that red race all over again. That's my prediction at least. Um, so that's basically about it. At first I will just restart my machine in a moment to give you the whole picture and also the output of the sound because it's way better with sound. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. So let's start in the back or whatever. Go wherever so you want. the question? Um, I restart my, my machine in the meantime, okay? Yeah. There was a, I worked for a previous company where they were quite looking forward these kind of technologies and uh, they enforced uh, you know, two-factor authentication for you know, for high purchase agreements and, you know, for sensitive assets or for, like, CF, the executive boards. And obviously people got quite annoyed because, you know, sometimes they, you know, they do say, oh, I need this order approved. They say, oh, well, you know, we need to do two-factor authentication over your mobile phone, obviously. But it's always the case of what's your risk profile, you know, if you, if you want to do that. But I guess, right, yeah. Of course, but if you look at, like, um, <gasps> sound, great. <laughs> That's um, <laughs> I mean, if you look at what you have to invest, basically, and what you get out of it. So say, yeah. in order to, to create a good fake, yeah, one which is really realistic, you don't have to invest like half a million dollars or so. You can say, okay, you can run it for about five or ten thousand dollars or euros, yeah? yeah? And you create a very decent fake, which is believable, yeah? So if you just blackmail someone with that for say half a million or a million, you have a good return of invest. <laughs> so um, it will just make it harder and, and harder to detect. And I mean, we all know, you know, I know that there is no patch for human stupidity. I wouldn't even call it stupidity, but the thing is, it's just developing so much. We have so many new technologies and how should you keep up with that if you're not working in, in the IT branch? And uh, or in the sector, so um, yeah, it's it's really hard to yeah. to detect that, and the the invest to have something like that it isn't so high. I mean, a lot of people already do own a graphics card, or maybe you might have a machine for cracking cracking hashes or so. You can use the exact same machine because it's just Python scripts in the end, which you can run and um, use that to to swap faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my my point was more that. It's kind of, you know, if you use multiple factor authentication, it would be cheap to defend as well, right? Because it's not, you're not you, need, you don't need to invest a lot in a, in a mobile app with two factor authentication I mean, if you have a request, right? The point, even if you have multi factor authentication or if you add technical layers, but yeah. as long as you can, win, can convince a person who has the yeah, access yeah, yeah, rights yeah. and that's what yeah. you are attacking with these kind of attack scenarios, you're not looking to exploit any technical flaw, but you're trying to exploit a person 
who has legitimate access to certain data or something you try to, to get a hold of yeah, as yeah. an attacker. And um, you will not have anything like, even with a two or a multi-factor authentication or whatnot you, you implement, you will always face the risk and, and the problem that you have a user who has a right and who should be able to work yeah, with yeah, that yeah. data. And so that is, um, yeah, that's the issue there. Yeah. Okay, another question here. Couldn't you establish something like a protocol over voice so that the CEO that calls actually has to authorize via a code word or something so that an attacker might not know this password? I was having a conversation earlier today and there was something like, um, how about you put a watermark in there? Like something hidden which you cannot see or hear by yourself, but then, but you also have to have any means of detection of that. For instance, a secretary, whatever, who's called, she would have to have something to detect that in real, or in real time, basically. And even if you implement something like that, what prevents attackers from then going ahead and also finding out about that? Yeah, I mean, it might make it harder, but I don't believe that's like a solution which can prevent it in the end. It just makes it harder as with like anti-malware products or so. It usually just makes it harder for an attacker, but it's not like really ruling it out entirely. Before the next question, let me just try if now the sound works. Nope. What, what's, what's wrong? I, do, I don't know. So we continue with the questions. Oh, yeah. it is over there? Yeah, should be. You know what? I have to unplug the... Might sound strange, but we give it a try because it was working when we tried it out with sound. I just do unplug the. Do we have some sound now? We are. Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, over display port though. Yeah, l let me just. I mean, you know the video by now, so um, just just listen to how it would sound like then. Um, oh wait, that's a wrong presentation. So. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to Area 41 in Switzerland. Have fun with my friend Dave's presentation, Replacing Reality. Talk about. Yeah, so now you know what I meant with the echo and the artifacts in there, yeah? That's just because that um, publicly, publicly available samples or implementations of these papers are not as far as ones, for instance, of Google's Tacotron um, group. And here are the other samples I want to show you how it can sound like. Well. Into a moth-eaten chair next to the desk. There was only one thing on it apart from his half-completed form. A large, glossy purple. Wait, so let's go. Thinking that he should probably wait for Filch to come back. Harry sank into a moth-eaten chair next to the desk. There was a... Okay, that was one of them. Then Thinking that he should probably wait for Filch to come back, Harry sank into a moth-eaten chair next to the desk. There was only one thing on it apart... And... Thinking that he should probably wait for Filch to come back, Harry sank into a moth-eaten chair next to the desk. There were... So these were the same sentences, just synthesized with different voices, but they are all artificially generated just to give you an impression on how it can already sound like. That it's not like my proof of concept, I didn't spend too much time on that. You can optimize that and it doesn't take forever. Um, 
but basically just to give you an impression, it's not always to have these artifacts in there, but even with a good pretext, um, you could get something which people believe. If you say, hey, I'm just having a bad reception here and that's why I sound a little bit off. I mean, you might know like how people sound then. Um, so yeah, that was for the audio part. So we had another question. Oh. Do you, do you think with enough training we would be able to bypass a biometric voice print system with a deep fake? Might be possible, yeah. I, I didn't try it out myself yet, but that's something where it's depending how good the, the detection system will be, but you might be able to do that, yeah. Okay, another question. Uh, how does the uh, face swap uh, work with uh, facial hair? And did you shave just for the demo? Yes, that's why I want to say initially, usually I, wear, I have a beard, longer one, but I shaved exactly for that because um, if you're having a beard, it doesn't really detect it or swap it that well yet. I mean, they might implement something, but um, as I mentioned, in order to achieve the best results, you basically should take a similar looking person. Like me and swapping myself with, I don't know, um, Obama for instance, that wouldn't work that well. But um, if you go ahead and look onto YouTube, you will find a video where Obama is talking smack about Trump. And after a couple of seconds, they show a side by side where they have a different actor who's also black, but he's just where you can see where like the one I showed you was my side-by-side -side comparison. And um, basically, yeah, it's just, it will be very, very hard to detect that in the future. And yes, I shave for that, for that reason. Other questions? Other questions? Yeah, here one more. Uh, taking this to the extreme, uh, Two weeks ago, federal government proposed a draft law on, on electronic IDs in Switzerland. And they would imply that for a strong electronic authentication, you would need two-factor authentication, and one of them needs to be biometric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so do you, are we on the wrong track here? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, I'm not sure where exactly, but they required you for for something online if you register to basically show your ID card. You know, just, and they would recognize the ID card in your face. But yeah, in the extreme, you could just fake it. And the thing is what I read from one of the, the German news portals, they didn't report about fake porn for, that, that was cool and that was a little different topic, but they said, in the future, we will have to deal with that there is a different reality, which is not our personal one if we act in person, but online. Um, I mean, you all know, never trust anyone to be what they pretend to be online, but that makes it even harder now. And yeah, with, I mean, it, it's a question, is biometric authentication, which is not having you there in person, really working? And I bet, no, it won't. Because with technology like that, which everyone can use, it's not that you have to invest thousands of dollars even. I mean, a lot of younger guys, you don't even need the latest NVIDIA graphics card or so, but you should have a quite decent video memory on there to, to um, have multiple layers to, for that machine to learn. But anyway, you can just do it at home with next to no cost. And we have to think about how will we deal with that in the future. And I cannot give you a solution or a perfect answer for that. What I can do or what our company can do, for instance, is giving security trainings or um, attacks, just showing people that it's possible that they are, they are at least aware of the fact that what is possible right now. It's no Hollywood movie anymore or any any series where it looks like it's it's science fiction or so. It's just starting to get real. And um, a prediction might be that next year you can read on the, the buzzword bingos, you can read deepfakes too or something like that. But because that is just something 
which will come up and which will also have an impact because basically you have limitless possibilities um, and these are not technical and you cannot just patch a technical flaw to prevent that from happening and I also had conversations about um, yeah what should a company do I mean you cannot just tear down your website you cannot just remove all your um, profiles on social networks um, you cannot just remove your uh, interviews on on YouTube or wherever because you need to do business I mean you cannot just you know, remove everything you, you do in order to create new business. So um, that will be a challenge for, for the security sector too, in order how to deal with that and how to at least um, enable people to maybe detect what's going on or that it might not be true. But we're facing very serious challenges with that. That's my opinion at least. Maybe someone else is um, of different opinions, of course, why not? But um, that is just what I see in the future coming up and a pretty big challenge which is, which is not just technically um, possible to solve at all. I mean, techni or technical stuff could help, but yeah, we will see how, how that develops. I cannot really tell you right now. And Any other questions for the speaker? Yeah. We start to use uh, certificates to sign their videos so that people say this is actually a signed version of my PR. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the question is, like, can we sign it or just, it, it goes into the same dire direction, like, can we waterproof in some way our audio files or so? But it will be very hard because you not only need to sign them, but you also need whoever is receiving that to also um, be able to verify the signature of it. And you, if you have any news agency who doesn't, you, you know, they just want to be first to bring out some, some very uh, recent news or the, the latest news, and they don't check the source at all. So they just spread the word and other news agencies will pick it up too without checking it. And so you can just like create a disaster. I mean, and it's, it's very hard. Just imagine like Trump would declare war on North Korea, for instance. I mean, just an example. Who would know if that's real? And we're not talking about like a Hollywood clip or anything, but give me like a week of time and I would create a better result and which is looking so good that, well, Kim Jong might just shoot some rockets at America to have the first strike. And this basically is a very, very creepy outlook to the future, in my opinion. Good. We have maybe time for one more quick question. Is there one more question? Looks like not. So. Thanks again for the talk. Thank the speaker. Thank you for being here. Please.